thank you so much for the opportunity. And great to see everybody on the call. Um, I had the, a lot of fun building this. Um, so I hope you have fun listening as well. Um, so we'll talk about price fall and rise of semantic layer. What it is, where it came from, where it gets. Why do you care? Now, can I can talk for you as you are muted. Um, no, just kidding. Um, so um, but I, I've been an analyst for a while. Mostly over the last couple of years, I've talked to a lot of people dealing with data, asking about them what they do coming to work in the morning um, and hearing a lot of different answers building stuff, discovering stuff, understanding stuff, validating, onboarding, um, untangling the daily mess. And, and I think it represents to a lot of people who need to extract some value from data. And it boils down to essentially everybody talking about they want to get things from data faster, they want to get things from data easier. And most importantly, no one wants to be wrong. No one wants to be the one who said the bad number and um, and can't explain how you got there. And then they say there's the magic solution of being faster, being easier, being not wrong. As I'm unclear, is it, is it not? Let's talk about it. Um, but if you are on that kind of want to understand it, that's in magic solution, then that, that's probably why you should you care. What should I care? Um, ah, by the way, this has been um, a hot topic over uh, uh, the last year or two, getting a lot of new names. So when people say semantic layer, they might say metric layer, entity layer, metric store, headless BI, um, so many new names. And it was cool. And then for a while, it stopped being cool. This new cool stuff came and entered the room. Um, we'll get to that. But first, I said, who am I? So my name is David. Um, well, I like semantic layers. This is how I had fun uh, building this this storyline because they're cool and I'm a long time fan. I also founded a company that builds a semantic layer, which probably makes me a bit biased in, in talking about that. That company is called Honeydew and we won't talk about it. We'll talk about the history of semantic layers. And and then this and I think this for me it's almost like a a movie, a murder story of things coming and getting killed and getting killed the killer getting killed and 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 changes that everybody goes through and we'll find them out. First, what is a semantic layer? So I went to Wikipedia. Wikipedia gave me um, a long list of definitions. In fact, asking Wikipedia, what is a semantic layer? I got five different definitions all on the same page. And try to understand them. The first said, a semantic layer is a business representation so people can access data. That sounds helpful. Um, second one, same page, talked about it's a way that we can map the complex data we deal with, product, customers, and revenue into one consolidated single view. That sounds helpful as well. The third got talking about business users, who people use the data, getting common look and feel on all of cubes. This is where it started to lose us. Um, the fourth one, I won't even bother to read. It's been really too long. And the fifth one was really simple. Um, it's just a way to map your tables and your rows to objects. I like this. But when I think about the semantic layer, I try to think about first on how it starts. 
Um, and for that, we'll use an imaginary person named Eddie, the original semantic layer. Because, and, and I, I've been that Eddie for like, my previous company. Um, when a company is small, and it starts to grow, people start to use the product, questions start to come around data. Let's project our revenue. Let's understand where our customers come from. Um, and they start asking. And but the data it gets complex. Um, so at some point, they reach a scale saying, let's hire a data person. Let's hire someone who can just get some order of that mess that, of the data we have so we can understand the metric, like revenue. And um, Eddie comes, understands what's happening, and essentially builds, it's called a script. Might be a bunch of queries, might be a bunch of models, might be something in Python, but builds this beast. It takes the mess and gets out a dashboard, a report, a metric. In essence, Eddie needs to provide to the small organization where he is, is dealing with all the mess, the ability to be flexible with data as each question change, the ability to be consistent. So when uh, things are changing, you know how and why and when, and the ability to understand why a revenue has changed, where it came from, which made Eddie, our imaginary plumber, um, this gap your business and data. Sorry, let's mute again. Thank you. Um, and and, and I, the way I think about it, this Eddie guy um, who's filling that gap, explaining all the data complexity, abstracting it to the, to the business side as the first semantic layer. But anyways, the scripts get complex and adequate, which led the, leads us to the first chapter of our story, the rise of a semantic layer. So um, with your permission, I said I had fun building that. And part of that fun was digging in into the history of, of the semantic layer itself. And I want to start with 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 um, a day in 1992. Um, that day has been probably a very slow news day. Like you take a look at the first page of the New York Times on May 29th, 1992, you see something talking about how newspaper drivers ratify pacts with the distributor. When a newspaper writes on about itself on the first page, that usually means that nothing has been happening that day. Um, but also, one thing has happened that day, which was, I think, pretty important. Probably should have been on the above the fold in the New York Times. Um, business object obtained the patent. Uh, 555503, it's not an imaginary number, that says about how you can provide a new data representation and a query technique so end users can access the database without knowing the structure without knowing what's underneath, which is a key concept, I think, in semantic layers. Um, and if you take a couple of years before that fateful day in 1992, uh, Oracle made an application in 1990. Its name was EasySQL. The idea of EasySQL was you got an Oracle in your organization. The Oracle gets really complex, so you need this easier way to um, ask questions about all your data in your Oracle. And unfortunately, easy it was not. And the company, the first one, one company that complained that easy it was not was EDF, which is a very large utility company in France. They had an HR department who tried to understand the 5,000 engineers of EDF. Um, Analytics like what kind of degrees do they have? Uh, was their education? And um, giving they being the HR department, 
didn't have a lot of data skills, but Easy SQL was not the one that helped them. Um, and two Oracle uh, sales engineer and, and a marketing person joined up with a guy named Jean-Michel Convo, uh, sitting in an attic in Lamary uh, Quarry with a new idea. Let's build something that's actually easy. It allows those HR analysts at EDF um, understand the Oracle data without thinking about all the complexity, without thinking about everything that they may, may, might mess up. But I find it fascinating thinking about what kind of HR analytics people have been doing uh, 30 years ago already. But that aside, um, those three created a company called Business Objects, um, which populated the idea that you can take a concept, a business concept, like say an inventory, um, and create a virtual representation of it. Have a place where it says how a product maps to your data, which isn't a person, which is software that makes sure that every time you ask about products, it goes the same way. It was really a re revolutionary idea in 1992. In parallel, about the same time, um, there was a company in Israel in um, 1993 called Panorama here in Tel Aviv. Um, Panorama found a cool idea by Edgar F. Kodd uh, from 1993 called Olap. Olap was, was a way of saying, let's represent data in a way that makes it easier to answer a question, an analytic question on it. How many hammers have we sold in May in Seattle? Probably like hammer setter. And um, Panorama built the first Ola product on the market. Microsoft in 1996 acquired the small Israeli company um, called Panorama and made it into Microsoft Analysis Services, the one that you know today as uh, probably Power BI. And they took this idea of let's have a cube. Cube is, so I put all my data across every possible intersection of it. Um, my products, my geographies, my time, and every intersection, I write what, it, what is there. How many laptops have been sold in Asia in Q2? And I can sum up every line, every row, every column of that cube, which is really performant and a very neat idea. It also forces you to define how you map product sent have the map geography. Essentially, in the 90s, those things start to converge. The idea we can have a concept that represents data, and the idea we can have this neat representation of a cube that makes it easy to ask questions about it. Um, and if you take a few years forward and think about um, what's the difference between an OLAP cube and a semantic layer, uh, that probably isn't because an OLAP cube, and those of us who have a bit more gray air, uh, remember working those forces you to model data, which means capture concepts, which means create a way for people to agree on. And some of you have probably used or know OLAP cubes with semantic models in use today, like Tableau or Sysense or Power BI. That was the right. And some of that semantic layers remain today in use in many companies. And then something killed it. And, um, and it is now, from, I think it's my opinion speaking from here, which is less history, but more of how I try to um, uh, look at what have been happening. And I think, because I was asked, talking with a lot of people and thinking about what killed it. Why, why people don't like this? business objects slash all of cubes ideas that have been so successful for um, a decade or two. And I think there are a few answers here. One, just too many data, too much data. Really? Yeah, sorry. Um, if there's a question, you can feel free to interject, so. Um, 
So I think that one of things that I'm thinking about is there's just too much data. There's too many cubes to build. Not everything no longer fits in a cube. So there's a physical reason. Um, another one is that people have been moving from having like everything really orderly into things like a JSON. So you have you have developer the right a piece of data in a JSON event, and no one controls um, how it looks like, how it's named, how it's built there, um, and um, and this ability to really easily generate data and not think about it makes it easy to generate a lot of data, much harder, much harder to put it in a cube that needs design. And at a scale, people have been moving to data lakes, which means um, we don't think about the data until we read it. We put data uh, in a lake and we do something that's called schema on read. Uh, just ask about it instead of modeling it and understand the schema once we read the data, which is again like an antithesis, that's a whole cube idea. And then you have a snowflake or a BigQuery or a Redshift, and it's fast. So the like the performance concerns of having everything in this cube is just not as important because things are fast. Uh, and a lot of things you can just guess just get by with a snowflake. And then there is also you. And by you, I mean me and some people of the call, and by you, I mean analysts. There's just, just so many of you. And you have so many different demands and they can't agree about anything. And your demands keep changing because the business keeps changing and no cube keeps up. And this rise in built to use data the size of data, just the amount of people made all this old idea of let's model something kind of anachronism, kind of old. But it didn't end there. Because so now we've passed two decades. The decade people have been using cubes and semantic layers, and the decade people have been not. And when they have been not using the semantic models and cubes, they still had to think about um, how to model data. The thing had to think about how to make sure it's consistent. And when we talk to a company today on a Snowflake, I think the most common answer there is let's just build data transformations. Uh, when a semantic layer always has been just about transforming data from some raw, messy state into some organized, reusable, good state. Um, and I think the, the, the biggest representative of that kind of thinking is dbt, because dbt is an open source ETL tool, and you can find almost in any company uh, on the modern data stack, and not the companies who aren't, uh, dbt or something like that, which just deals with transforming data from all those sources to whoever uses it, ensuring this consistency. And some people even just say, okay, this is my semantic layer. I have this script, this one big script now look, that looks like a thousand dbt models who just takes data in and puts metrics and stuff that people can use and report out. But then as this Eddie script from the beginning, these things get pretty complicated. And they start to not be able to answer those basic properties of a semantic layer of what Eddie did, which is um, make it understandable and easy to understand where something came from. Or make it flexible so you can take something you've been asking about, the concept, and mesh it up in a new way, um, in an easy way. And, and even no longer can provide really consistency. Because when you get to 1,000 dbt models or 1,000 transformations, it's not, and it's not about dbt, by the way. It's about the approach. Um, but when you get to 1,000 different ways to calculate, it's really hard to make sure they all do the same way. They all do the same thing. Um, it takes a lot of effort and discipline. So you kind of back to the basics. 
And some companies have been thinking about it since the last, the last like, probably five to seven years and emerged a new approach. Um, and those companies are the huge ones in, in the Valley, Airbnb and Uber and LinkedIn. And you can find things like that and also uh, less, less known about in companies like Netflix and Intuit. Um, they call it a metric store. And uh, we'll, we'll like, talk about specifically Airbnb um, as they have been um, very open about how it works. Now, um, what the metric store is, uh, was that come from how Airbnb grew. So um, this is the Airbnb um, data stack a while ago. And so they take a lot of data and they put it in a lot of tables, um, different dimensions, different uh, facts, understanding visits and bookings and everything about Airbnb's hospitality business. And then they have a lot of users. So they create for them the right tables that combine those data sources with the metrics someone cares about, um, how many bookings did they have in a specific region, whether our promotion work or not, and um, serve that to different tools. And the more derived tables they had, meaning the more users and uses of the data they had, the more transformation flows within the core tables they had, and the harder it was to move along, the more mess there, there was to deal with. Um, it's kind of how a lot of transformation-based architectures look like. So they had this neat idea, which was very cool. Um, let's have a place where we can encapsulate the metrics and the business concepts that is responsible to map it to data and that it's shared for the different uses, which probably fits very neatly the definition of a semantic layer. They call it Minerva, and the tech they use there is called programmatic denormalization, which we won't get into, but uh, um, is, was, was essentially really interesting and is a way to um, automate transformation in a in, in, in reusable way. Um, but what Minerva gave them, which is Again, a bit of the basics because it will talk to a semantic layer company from a couple of decades ago that things were obvious. They gave it a way to move from a very long process where from the defining of something to an insight, you go through a lot of steps, all based on the fact that everything is complex, to just being able to update Minerva and let Minerva, a software stack instead of people, take care of that. And and I really like, like they had a few blog posts there, but they really like this line that I highlighted here. Because what Airbnb found out, and probably a lot, um, an internal truth in data, but they found out it for them again, is that when you let the users focus on the what, want to understand the bookings, I want to understand revenue, I want to understand by geography, instead of the how, everybody wins. Users can be more efficient. Um, data scientists can get to their needs better. Um, insights are better. And, um, and it's, the more you enable that, the more people are using that. And, and, and then it expands and being adopted. And, um, and that's essentially how reinvention of the semantic layer <clears throat> sorry, today looks like place where you define concepts that is no longer a cube. That's one that automates transformations, but still keeps this idea of having one place to define what the something is. So the tech change by the idea isn't. And, um, and we come close, closer to the close, but um, this re-rise has led to a bunch of new uh, solutions today that try to recreate this um, 30 year old idea um, where it's Malloy coming from the creator of, of Looker within Google uh, or DBT metrics. Um, let's say, let's have this layer 
that encodes stuff and creates the transformations and queries for everybody to use, um, just without the queue. Two, one of them that's um, everyone can check out is called Metric Flow. Uh, it was uh, created by actually the, some of the Airbnb guys um, that implemented Minerva. That um, as things go today, created that as a um, bunch of YAML text files sit in the Git that power um, a, an automatic transformation flow. Um, there's also a cool neat product called Honeydew. Um, you could go check it out. Um, and I'll, bottom line for me is that everything goes in the circles. And since that the semantic layer might rise from the ashes, but I might be biased here. Um, to close this, what's next? Or um, do semantic layers become cool again and overtake the hype of LLMs? And the answer is maybe. I think that if you look at decade forward, semantic layers are the part that understands what things mean. While LLMs understands what human asks, none can really live without the other. Because an LLM without understanding the concepts will hallucinate. And a semantic layer by itself tends to get complex. This is why we have the circles that makes harder for just people to ask. Combination of those two is probably the future of this re-emerging cycle. Um, and that's about it. Um, so I really hope you had as fun listening as I had fun building that. Um, if there is any desire for a Q&A or talking about those stuff. Thank you. It was very uh, nice lecture. Hi, David. Uh, I have a question to you. If I sure. Can. Oh, of course. So, so, so. So, so, so uh, you mentioned like because actually we're building a LLM park. And I, yeah, maybe I'll just so. My name is Misha. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Mobile AI, and we are building actually this left part of what you showed, and that's why I'm interested in the semantic layers because essentially mm -hmm. you need them in order to actually build logic uh, on top and then be able to provide business stakeholders to get the knowledge out of the data. And I'm curious just to learn the landscape because from what I saw how semantic layers look like it's more uh, like a dbt layer for example it's it's for it's more for the data engineers that just describe the data define very strictly etc uh, mm -hmm. how the rest of the landscape is look like so it will look like then like an emerging semantic layers and talking about with DBT build and talking about uh, ad scale and talking about us and, and, and other companies like that. Um, it kind of starts to move away from like really engineering um, queries and into defining, really defining concepts. Whether it's a YAML file that gives things names and descriptions. Um, um, the key differentiator of semantic layer of today from the like only transformation to the key situations is one is understanding relationships in data. So understanding how uh, say a product ID maps to user ID, uh, which how which join path you need to take or how we move that levels of granularity, whether it's a many to one relation or there's a bunch of those. Understanding those relations is big part of what a semantic layer does because it makes a lot of things reusable. And also as for like the left part of it, it makes a lot of things easier to reason about because uh, you don't need to worry about relations. The semantic layer does that. And also this like new style semantic layers, they understand lineage in a way that's really different from ETL. ETL lineage is I have a table, and it builds another table and builds another table and so forth. Semantic lineage is a have a revenue, a booked revenue metric, and that's derived from the revenue metric and from how you define what is a booking. 
uh, which is each one of them is a concept. So, and that kind of semantic lineage is again, something that's much closer to how the business thinks like and how something like an LM can leverage to be able to um, ask about data. Does it make sense? Like, I'm not sure. If I'm yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's a little bit hard to, to get it without the schemas, you know, without visual information, but I feel like I, I, I feel like I get in most of it, so it's fine. Thanks. I think one of the things that we lack, and I don't know if there is a solution uh, inside, is a standardization of how a semantic layer looks like. Um, otherwise, every LLM and, and, and everything that runs on it will have to be specific per layer. I would just probably all the idea of all, all this reemergence of a semantic layer just to need to have full agreement on how it looks like. Um, my own bet is probably going to look like like much closer to SQL than to anything else. Um, but that's one of the uh, uh, open questions for now. So it's basically to sum up, it's just developing and there are no standards and uh, people are experimenting with that at this moment, right? Yeah, but probably um, we'll, we'll just, what's, what will get adopted? Nothing, nothing works in the level the developing startups, but something will get adopted. And because this is such a painful area, and so many people thinking about it, and so many companies got to the stage where, where they need a semantic layer, now start to realize this is what they need because of the circle of, of, of data, um, things will get adopted and that will give emergence to standards. Mass semantic layers are can be masqueraded one as another. They get smart enough and the basic concepts are the same. So if there will be a standardization, it might come from DBT, it might come from someone else, that would probably align everybody in the long term. Thank you very much, David. And uh, see you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.